Good evening. Welcome to the Rocky Mountain College of Art and Design. I'm Gretchen Marie Schaefer, and I'm the director of REMCAD's Visiting Artist, Scholar, and Designer program. The VASD program is an interdisciplinary initiative that values passionate curiosity and explores critical, diverse, and creative inquiry through a variety of events and presentations. We are so proud to further enrich the academic experience for all of our students here at the college and to serve the greater Denver metro community. This evening's presentation is the third in the VASD program's fiction series, which investigates the complicated relationship between contemporary artists and veracity. In broad swaths of contem contemporary life and culture, notions of shared objective truths are currently being challenged and blurred in new ways. However, there is a long and rich history of artworks that intentionally mislead and falsify. In the context of art, these illusions are permitted. They're even expected and desired, and often wield the hoax as an instrument for truth. This series then explores what it means to create and revel in imagined and simulated worlds, uncanny characters, and magical actions at a time when the slippage between truth and fiction muddles our modern lives. We continue this inquiry tonight with artist Louis Hesper and his lecture titled Symbols of Resistance. A sculptor working in photography and film, Luis is a first-generation American raised in Miami, Florida, and visually and culturally influenced by his Cuban-American lineage. He earned his bachelor's degree from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and his MFA from Yale. Luis's work has been exhibited internationally in galleries including, including Mary Boone and Gagosian, and museums such as the Brooklyn Museum of Art, the Studio Museum in Harlem, the Whitney Museum of American Art, and the Royal Academy in London. His work is in the permanent collections of the uh, Guggenheim Museum, the New Museum of Contemporary Art, and the Perez Museum, among others. He currently lives and works in Brooklyn. Luisa's sculptures, photos, and films exist at a vibrant flashpoint where the immigrant experience intersects with American popular imagination, class values, status-driven subcultures, and art history. Sorry, I can't see with the backlit of the <laughs> computer <laughs> just now. Um, and um, pursuing these deep social caverns Pursuing deep social caverns occupied by passionate and niche subcultures, Luisa's imagery layers significance in worlds within worlds within worlds. And from these depths, objects signal specific messages about the identity and desires of the individuals living there. Tonight, Luis invites us to follow him into some of these beautiful rabbit holes by considering the ways objects of ornamentation like jewelry, fashion, and custom automobiles can be subtle and sometimes not so subtle signifiers of protest employed by immigrants and people of color. As a form of resistance, these objects are capable of preserving genuine identity while also standing in opposition to police violence, judicial discrimination, and a lack of educational and employment opportunities. By, considering fictional, by constructing fictional images from real and ardent enthusiasts struggling against real and fervent discrimination, Luisa's work visualizes the simultaneous reverence and revulsion of the cult of authenticity, the allure and fantasy of wealth, and the theater of personal narrative. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome Luis Hesver. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. <clears throat> Hi, good evening. Thanks for coming. Um, so tonight, I'm gonna share with you guys um, work starting like 1999, 1998, and it's not gonna be completely chronological because I work in, um, multiple mediums at the same time. So we're gonna, these projects that you're gonna see are usually the sculpture, photography, and the films, and installations are happening simultaneously, um, and sometimes they're exhibited together. Um, but just to kind of give you a, 
a reference to, to frame the work, um, how thinking of this idea of like symbols of resistance. Um, and I was just asking myself this question when I was asked to, to visit, and uh, it's like, why, you know, what's, a, what's the job of an artist, or what does an artist do? And for me, I guess it's been always uh, telling the story of how I experienced the world. And uh, so questions like, how do you tell that story? And, you know, your environment, memories, experience, you know, that make you. Um, but so early on, for some reason, um, I wasn't drawn to a more documentarian type of uh, uh, direction when there was that option, say, when you're in art school and you're taking photography. And I think it has something to do with the way I was raised, the environment I was raised in, where um, there was, uh, so my parents, my family are immigrants, uh, refugees from Cuba, and so always at the, in the house, and the community, there was always this, like, uh, there, was, there was always a very, it was very political, very polemic, and fraught with, um, you know, current events and history as it related to America, United States and the Americas. So there was this, it was very close to this, this reality. And there was a lot of history of my family of suffering and people killed and people in jail and, and a family split down the middle. Half was communist, half was not communist. And, you know, aunts not talking to each other for 40 years and that whole deal. So in a way that, so there was, but I experienced all this through stories, through secondhand narratives, these very embellished big stories that my grandfather and everyone else in the family would talk about. So early on, this, um, uh, so in a way it was like, it was too, I was very close, I guess, to the, the real, if you would call it, of what was going on. So I kind of escaped into these, uh, you could say, fictions and narratives. I was very drawn as a kid to fantasy movies, science fiction, and, um, but also, but the storytelling, these, these big yarns, but they were also historical dramas of what was going on, but, but there were always, so that somehow, I think, had something to do with what happened later. So to go back, um, um, so I ended up, I guess, creating fictions based on real experiences. And um, uh, so like this idea, like I've thought about, um, uh, like sometimes dreams are um, uh, inadequate, you know, sometimes they're brief for uh, content, but they're very rich in sensation and thoughts. So a lot of the work you're going to see, dreams play a part into it. Um, so it's just, this is an early work from a sculpture that I'm, uh, this is probably like 1999. And so at this point, I've already been to art school and, um, you know, making art, trying to figure out what to do, you know, how it works. And um, so at this point, it was um, trying to uh, tap into experiences, like this early body, this body of work started and it continues to tap into, try to unlearn everything I had picked up in art school. And at, because I had art school, I be, my art school days was very heavy onto conceptual art and basically read myself into a corner where I couldn't make anything. And I was making films, because, but I didn't want to make objects. So when I would get out of school and I'm out for about <laughs> three years and I traveled and just worked weird, odd jobs and decided to go back and start making art and I had to tap into experiences and memories that I would call before I knew what art was, meaning a formal idea of what art history was. So I started tapping into my experience of junior high and high school and these activities that we used to do, which was tricking out cars, Miami lowriders, and pulling out the back seat and the trunks of cars full of speakers, and um, and this all, and this, just the uh, so the series of sculptures came up. Um, they were like these function. They were basically f furniture. They were functional speakers. So this, the dimensions of this speaker box was taken from a Cabossier, uh, like Cabossier. Um, chair and but it's it's just a subwoofer when you sit on it it would activate by your weight and it would play just low frequency and rumble and there were dance platforms that were you have to stand on it and dance and the music would play and there would always be like a curated soundtrack and it would be some really schmaltzy like freestyle like love song or um 
the Miami bass tracks um, this installation was. This is probably like, yeah, 99, 2000. Um, old Galaga um, cabinets that were, there's no, they were covered in the a speaker felt that you would see in nightclubs or in trunks of cars. And there's a laser beam that connects them like an umbilical cord. And they would just sit there quietly in a room. Um, so, I, so I start to think about all of these um, things that exist in the world that I was living in. So jewelry, ornamentation, fashion, cost, custom automobiles, home decor, but that it was all rooted in cultural traditions, right? And, but in a way, I always, they act, in a way they acted as a, uh, a similar resistance, I would say, because the way it works is, um, the way that I saw it, I still see it to this, to this day, um, the, for example, let's just talk about jewelry, for example, which played a big part in a lot of this series of, these are, this is a series of photographs. So I started creating these characters. This was like, and I was approaching them in a way like writing a, a play, writing a film, but they were photographs and there was this cast of characters of these cheerleaders, these squads of cheerleaders, and then they would have these poses that were inspired by allegorical paintings from the Renaissance or Baroque era. And, but looking at the way that they would dress, the way that they wore their jewelry, so in a way, um, so jewelry is very important in immigrant communities and say poor people or people of color because a lot of uh, families, like they don't have, when they immigrate, sometimes when they, all they can take out from their countries is usually a piece of jewelry or some kind of small heirloom. But it goes beyond that because a lot of people can't in that socioeconomic circle, uh, they can't uh, inherit property or trust funds or, uh, so what they pass on is usually jewelry. And it's, if I say it's fake, bought at the, uh, at the mall, sometimes it's real, but it has this uh, uh, very important signifier because it, it's given an important uh, markers and stages in life, like birthdays, graduations, weddings, or funerals. So, um, and, for a long time, this, um, this, these accoutrements would exist in this safe community space, meaning uh, they weren't really seen outside of in mainstream, let's say, American culture. So for a long time, uh, you know, door knocker earring, uh, earrings or long nails, red lipstick, uh, certain style, you know, should never be worn in a professional setting, right? Because it might limit how seriously you're taken and it limits how much access you have, right? And it's also connected to how you speak and all of that. And this is what I'm talking, this is like the 90s, right? But eventually, it, it gets interesting because I started looking into this and around that time. And then, as, and as this is all going on, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's trying to, what I'm interested in is referencing all of these things that are interesting to me. So coming from, an art school background, I'm interested in referencing art history, but at the same time, I'm also interested in referencing things outside of art in material culture. And the work for me was always very important that it, 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 would, it, it does function mostly and it's seen in an art context, in museums or galleries, but every so often when it would go off into another a realm into a more popular realm, it was always important to me that the images and the work have some kind of, have a resonance or a dialogue with an uninitiated audience, someone who didn't really know art history or get all the points, but could have some kind of visceral or visual reference point. Um, so eventually what happens is that, what's inter interesting to me, is, and I continue to look at that, is that point where something that's considered a subcultural activity, you know, it could be anything from skater culture to uh, Miami base uh, chonga style or, or um, in LA uh, chola style, how it eventually starts to enter the mainstream, which is like the history of America, that immigrants bring their traditions over and eventually they creep into and become American mainstream. And it was interesting because around the time I was doing this work, I don't remember what year it was when, um, I'm trying to remember, maybe 08 or 09, um, if anyone knows the date, you can correct me, but um, when the show, when the, the, the Carrie nameplate jewelry became a thing, when th that show, uh, Sex and the City, 
you know, made the uh, the nameplate gold thing acceptable or, or cool or interesting to middle or upper middle class white women. And that was an interesting point because up to that point, it had always been associated with, you know, you know, hood girls, hip hop. And that was like one example. And then there's, there's many more. Um, so it kind of entered the mainstream. And so as I'm looking at this stuff, um, also keeping, you know, mind you, my interest in the, in the absurd. Uh, humor plays a big part of it. Uh, satire. Um, let's see, so this is like a, a, you know, so this series of the cheerleaders, which it was about, so I work in series and they, they end, there's these finite series and they, I move on to different ideas. Like there were videos. Um, this one came out around, the, I think, uh, right before, it's like 2002. A video like that would work projected about that size in a, in a room in an endless loop and really loud, and it um, and so and it's interesting because like as of recent and it continues to happen like I think like latest like Gucci is recently like a couple of collections ago and and, and Mark Jacobs on a runway is continuing to appropriate certain styles like they like Gucci recently I don't know if you guys ever heard of this guy named Dapper Dan we'll visit him later he was the guy who started to create in the 80s and early, late 80s, early 90s, started to appropriate um, fashion brands and create what this, these custom urban outfits that were being made in Harlem. And, um, to, and, he, and eventually he was shut down by the major brands and kind of disappeared. And as of recent, Gucci reappropriated his work and, and it's, it was in the last collection, and he and his son like stood up and made a big deal about it. And eventually, and this time, it's, instead of shutting him down and suing him, they co-opted him and actually brought him in to create the. So it's like 30 years later, Gucci says, "Oh, it's okay now. Now we could." Um, um, so as I'm working through these series, um, at this point, I have I don't know where I was living. I was living in um, in New York, and I decided to go back home and start. Uh, creating these fictions, these photographs, uh, creating this, a, a next series that we call the Urban Myth series. And I had to go back home and start casting family members. So it was this collaboration with them to talk about, create this fantastic scenario and take into consideration their ideas, their fantasies, and create these scenarios. So this was my sister when she was in high school with her best friends and her having the seance. Um, it's my mother. Grandmother, and then like you know, like a sense of the of the magical and the surreal. Because again, as a being being very interested in the the spectacle of of the fantastic and the uh, science fiction films and fantasy and special effects, and and that's what those green photographs were for, referencing the special effect where the you know the green background you would chroma key the idealized background, you know, key it in, because I was wanting to keep the green room so it could foreground the, um, the effect. I'd like to add. Um, and then um, next series after that, there was this uh, project that I collaborated with this filmmaker and musician named Jeffrey Reed from Los Angeles. And actually, we, we met in school, in grad school at Yale, and um, decided to, uh, I wrote this short film called Stereo Mongrel, and, uh, and there was a series of photographs. And the way this body of work existed was that there was a film, it's like a 10-minute experimental film, and a series of photographs. But the photographs were not stills from the film. They were not taken from the film. They were this world I had created, and the photographs were covering the area outside of the frames of the film. Like, this was going on in this world that we weren't experiencing. So you saw the photographs, you saw the film, but you didn't have to initially see them together for it to make sense. And these were all shot all over, like this is in Miami, um, Los Angeles. 
And these were shot in Miami in a part, a very bad neighborhood in Miami. Now it's funny because after Art Basel Fair got to Miami, this is pre-Art Basel. It's like when Art Basel was just getting, this has all been gentrified and now very posh and hip. Um, but my dad's work was a block away from here, so I spent many summers as a, as a child in this neighborhood, and there's this huge population of homeless people, and the crack epidemic never left this part of Miami. So these were people I knew that I grew up with. There were people who lived in the neighborhood that were homeless there for 20 years. Like, I saw them when I was in fourth grade, and I returned, you know, in... <laughs> 20 years, 25 years later, and they were still there, living in the same, you know, and reconnecting with them, and I cast them, you know, to be in these, in these photographs, in these films. And, um, and this was another, uh, this, was, this was shot in LA, and it was like a reconstruction of a Picasso painting, the Mademoiselle d'Avignon, and these were uh, uh, suicide, suicidegirls.com had just been launched, and these were some of the early models. Um, and this was, this is shot in Hawaii, and this is like, it was this kind of a, like a fake Buddhist temple. Like it's a Buddhist temple, but there was no, it, it, it was this very, it's artificial, very Hollywood Buddhist temple. So I created these uh, sculptures out of turntables and brought them in and presented them there and took a picture of them. And these are all shot on film. Like at this point, it's all large format photography, four by five, eight by 10. Um, with uh, minimal post. Um, uh, oh, so here's a, just a little snippet of that sterile mongrel movie. Um,
This film was commissioned by the Whitney Museum, and it was shot in the old, in the, in the Breuer bunker building, which is now the Met has it, but this is when the Whitney was still there. And they let us um, access the uh, collection and get the greatest hits of uh, pop art in there, and um, as a background. And it was just, I mean, it's just a little piece of it, but it's like this, this story of the voyage of this girl um, who is the, her father is the, is, one, is the guard, and her mom is one of the uh, uh, benefactors of the, of the museum, unidentified museum, and she has magical powers. And the whole movie was uh, designed, it was painstaking, it took forever to do, because I wanted to do it all analog and film and reference all the films that I had grown up with, and all the effects wanted to be done optically and um, to have that texture and feeling of older filmmaking, not you know, up to date, more digital effects. Um, so, uh, and that um, theme of, um, and a lot of this work, the films that we see one later, um, are inspired a lot by memories, childhood memories, childhood nightmares. While I'm doing this work, at this point, I, I started doing uh, analysis in New York, psychoanalysis, and I had been for a few years, and eventually this other project that shows up, I had started tapping into nightmares from my childhood, remembering them. and factoring that in. So then the sculptures continue, and there was this one series for this installation. Um, I did this one series of heart-shaped uh, subwoofers, and they would literally beat you know, to music, and they, were, um, have, they would have sensors that you'd walk through, they would activate, and they were usually out of phase, so one would go in, another one would go out. Um, and it was this moment in my life where it was just like really it was like relations were a disaster every time I made a movie a relationship would fall apart or a big project and um, and uh, like this sculpture here was part of um, it was uh, started working with this uh, these like like iconography like uh, these pyramids that were covered in uh, menthol cigarette uh, wrappers and these dogs these like rubber dogs that are it's basically it's a coffee table um, and referencing, again, certain minimalist uh, heroes of mine, but making it into a speaker. Um, 
and these were like these were called ships in the night. So these were like it was like a couple that was trying to communicate, but the speakers were out of phase. So they, they one would go in, one would go out. They were never synchronized. Um, and then this palette, you know, trap. This is around 2008, 2009, but tapping into the palette that I had grown up with in Miami. Um, and then you know, this leads into this other series of photographs. Well, this starts to happen. Around, this is all happening parallel. Um, where I wanted to, um, I had, a, the photographs I've been making up to that point always had characters and people in them, um, or some kind of narrative, and I wanted to, I had a hankering to do landscape photographs. Um, but I was trying to figure out how can I bring myself to make landscapes, like really cheesy, schmaltzy landscapes and sunsets. Um, but, because they're iconic and beautiful, but they're ubiquitous. So I thought about this idea um, of framing them from the point of view of certain vehicles. So it started with these iconic vehicles. So this is a reproduction of, um, and this project basically came out of wanting to get out of the studio. because I'm a studio-based artist, so everything happens in the studio. Everything is planned and executed. And I wanted to get out into the world. That was part of the landscape part, to get out into the landscape with a large format camera and travel and, and document landscapes. But also it had this other side of it where I wanted to started looking for iconic vehicles. So this is a reproduction of the uh, Knight Rider kit car from the show from the 80s. And this led me to a school teacher in Long Island who had built a reproduction of it in his garage. So that opened up this whole door of finding these people, and interacting with these people, and documenting what they had done. So it became this, but it was back to this idea that I had been involved with when I was in high school of customizing something that's mass produced, customizing cars. So this guy had bought this Firebird, and it probably had, at this point, it sunk about 60 grand into it. And the car is probably you know, worth about eight grand, but it, you know, but it was his, this obsession that he had. So there's a level of obsession that the owners of these cars had that I identified with, the same level of obsession that an artist has in a studio with process and materials. And so that, that led me then to go back and start to approach car clubs and uh, looking for people who have really modified and done radical changes to their cars. And there's like these personal pods, these, these, uh, uh, like these people were putting more effort and time into these cars than they were into their homes. So these, these cars were more considered in their homes. And, um, and I found that fascinating. Um, and they have all of these, the ones that had uh, AV systems that I would take, I would play through it these obscure like Cuban films that I from the 60s and 70s that no one would know about, but I just would drop it in there. Um, then this led me to uh, custom rigs, like long haul drivers. So these guys live in these trucks and for, for months on end. And then these landscapes, so it's a two photographs, right? The landscape photograph and then you find the, but to so this one, uh, was had a bit of a narrative with these ominous escalades and this ghost town out west. Um, then it became military airplanes, because then I started to look at the other, this is around the time where we had involved heavily in Iraq. And uh, so I started to look for these air, these military airplanes, a lot of, like some were spy planes, some were Cold War era. This is like the cockpit of the Enola Gay. Um, uh, and this leads me to that a series that um, connects to that guy Dapper Dan I was talking about. So as I was looking for custom cars, in my, I'm in Miami, and I meet this guy who had this Cadillac Escalade, and he had it done up in Takashi Murakami Louis Vuitton. Because around this time, uh, this must be like 2012 or something or 10. I think Murakami had done that collaboration with Louis Vuitton. And I was like, whoa, this is amazing. But I started talking to the guy, and the guy had no idea who Takashi Murakami was or cared. He just cared about Louis and the color, and we started talking about it. So I, he let me photograph his car. And I started talking to him, and I realized there's like a subculture within the culture of car customizing that does only, um, you know, there's so many, there's, there's some that are just do brand name, like there's Klondike bar cars, McDonald cars, Skittle cars. Uh, but there's this one that's just with the uh, designer brand. So then I set out on this two-year project. And this is the first time where the work took on uh, 
more of an anthropological documentary position because now I was going out into the world trying to find these things, um, which I had just stumbled upon. I mean, it kind of started because I was out of the studio looking for these cars, looking at the landscape. But now I, I tap into it and I find, um, so it became this obsession for two years to find as many cars as I could across the country that had some kind of designer label uh, custom, customization. So this one, for example, that spiral jetty uh, in the back that I went out. And it actually was a good year when it was actually above water. Um, and it was Grand Tetons. And it was interesting because, again, at this point now, I haven't, because I didn't want to photograph people for a while because it became problematic too that I was, at this point I had this crisis where uh, I felt like I'd been photographing people of color in a, certain, a lot. I mean, that's all I did, like, you know, Latinos, blacks, Asians, people I knew. And I started to realize, like, there was something going on where the images were being consumed and fetishized in a weird way that made me feel uncomfortable, even though they were being very received well, but in a way that I was questioning it. I decided to back off and start photographing these, these landscapes, these inanimate objects. So, but meaning the, the people, that, like the narratives that were built into each one of these cars, like this one was owned by a mail, is owned by a mailman who worked on it. And these were all, some of these people would do them at actual custom shops and pay for it, have professionals, but a lot of them were homemade in their garages. And these are large format, uh, prints and, and uh, film, and when you look at the close detail, you can see the hand and the imperfections of, of, of the craft of the people who are making them. Um, but then it leads me then to that the other, the garment side of it, that there's a whole underground, you know, black market system that, of people who forge and make their own clothing, and, and leads me to, so like, living to this guy who lives in, lives in Canada, um, who was a collector of Gucci and also MCM, and he had acquired from, because this is all fake, uh, it's all knockoffs, had acquired um, yards of MCM and was making gear. Again, but so it was the first time I make a photograph of a person, but again, I, a lot of these people didn't want to be identified because this is all, this is illegal and they, you know, um, activity. This lady, though, this is, then this gets back to Miami and this starts going into the culture of prom dresses wedding dresses customized based on designer fashion, but that's been appropriated. And the people who are making this are aware of these brands, but don't really care about hot couture or what, fa you know, what the collection is. They wanted to appropriate it. So this is like a Louis Vuitton flamenco dress for a bridesmaid. It just, it made sense, you know, to her world. And that is incredible, uh, a prom dress. Um, and then it led me in to find uh, um, furniture stores in, in inner city neighborhoods that have entire lines of knockoff furniture. Like, you know, like Chanel does not make a bedroom set. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna jump forward now to, um, this is also going, this is like some public artwork. Uh, I was commissioned by the uh, New York Public Art Fund to do this project in Brooklyn in this area called Metro Tech, which is close to this place called the Fulton Street Mall, which historically, you guys ever seen that book back in the day, which is, it came out like, like by Jamel Shabazz, and it came out, I don't know how long ago it came out, by Powerhouse, which documented early hip hop style. So this mall, Fulton Street Mall, is kind of ground zero where all of the hip hop style started in the 80s and it spread from there. And it's still there and it's still kind of vibrant in that way, like it's still connected to that. So I wanted to do this, um, a bench, and um, decided to, uh, and I collect radios, collect boom boxes, um, and I decided to tap into my personal collection of these things that I've had forever, and cast them in bronze, and then just do a very simple gestural move, just tack, welding them together to create a, a park bench. And so this is an icon that I've used, and this is another version of a, of a boom box, so now I start to abstract it or just to segment it or slice it. And this is larger than life. It's, a, it's about four and a half feet wide, three and a half feet tall. Um, 
And then um, the series then continued where I wanted, started working with my hand and making molds of my hand and creating these sculptures that had these kind of dumb use factor, uh, interested in you know, a, a flower pot. So a flower pot, like a cast of basketball in bronze and you cut it in half and you have a bowl and I cast my hand uh, and I can't balance a basketball and I'm terrible, I'm really bad at sports. So it was like this fantasy of projecting myself of being able to do that and all that. And, um, and creating a mobile uh, by casting solid bronze, some headphones that have, have them dangling, um, some nice chunky earrings. Um, and again, this piece over here is called Digital Drought. Um, again, kind of like this obsession with this uh, equipment, like these building blocks, these signs. Again, I, I would call them, again, we go back to the signs of, of resistance, like the turntable, the, the classic 1200 turntable, which was iconic when DJs would spin vinyl. So there's something kind of sad about this archaic. Uh, so again, like a little, uh, play like a little surreal, absurd humor, and the box references this, it's the actual size of a loudspeaker um, that's all cast in bronze, Maybe like a trophy. And what do we have here? Okay, so here's a sample of this other film, um, Smother, which this one was the product of, at this point, a lot of psychoanalysis and revisiting. So it's this, so talking about fantasies and fiction, they're reimagined. Uh, my memories of my childhood in Miami, and it's a lot of autobiographical, uh, like the bed, like I was a bedwetter, and all of this other good stuff is in here. Sabrá Dios 
Hoy, ¿dónde estás? Happy birthday to you, my darling. What are you gonna learn? You can't hide anything from me. What is this, four times this week? Yeah. Whatever. I'll deal with you in the morning. Understood? I saw you. Oh, man. Look, Mommy. You're dry. I had the worst nightmare. Don't you want to hear about my dream, sweetie? like you are now. Okay. Except what? you were huge. You were so big, like a giant. Wow. You could barely fit in our home. That's amazing. So guess what I did? What? I put you in the dryer. And I shrunk you. And when I went back to get you, I had shrunk you so small, I couldn't find you anywhere. I looked everywhere. No terrible giant, are you, Waylon? No, I'm little, like a mouse. That's right, you're little, forever. Take you back to your mama. Maybe Nora needs a big man, huh? What do you think? Mommy looks hot. She's kinda young, isn't she? She's got that look. It's like she wants something. What she want? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You want some of my drink, man? Hmm? Thank you. What? 
okay. What's the matter? Huh? Hey, where are you going? Hey, come here. in my car. <laughs> Thank you. I gave him a ride home. Looked like he was lost. Thanks. You thirsty? Yeah. They call elegant feet. Elegant. Yeah. Really. Mm. Okay. Thank Look at you. Look that. Next. No. Please. No. Here, let me see. No. Please. 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 Are you please? Oh, please. Here, let me. It's okay, you know. I know what it's like to lose something. I also know what it's like to find something. I can use my toes better than my hands. How's that? Watch. Oh. Uh -oh. oh boy. Wait, Linda. No! No! Fried turkey? Yeah. Yeah? I think sure. that butterball's thawed out.
So <clears throat> that one, I was, <laughs> was working some stuff out. Um, uh, yeah, so that was you know, referencing a lot of the you know, uh, movies that as a kid I was Im impressed by. And the dialogue, you know, and there's like a certain humor and tongue-in-cheekness, but this whole idea of this metamorphosis of the child and the, uh, the mother, and um, that, you know, a lot of it based on biographical things. So, going in and out of that, but having, again, shooting it on film and wanting to reference a very particular time, but this imagined uh, Miami of my childhood. Um, and that was just like a, actually like a little snippet. It's, it's a half an hour long, um, that's a whole part. That, so the narrative arc is not really that clear there, but so we'll move forward to the uh, bronze sculptures here, the series that continues that I've been working on where uh, taking, now going back to these signs, this idea of the uh, uh, signs of resistance, and I wanted to take uh, objects in the world that come from very different places, yeah, that represent very different, uh, uh, let's say, areas of, let's say, design, but also socioeconomic referencing. So 
an iconic Hans Wegner chair uh, cast in bronze and a exaggerated Cuban link chain that acts like a sword that's going, you know, penetrating and uh, going across this iconic. So it's these two worlds colliding and to create this discrete object. Um, I think it was a series of hands. This was based on, I got this idea. Uh, actually, it's, it's a cast of a hand of a friend of mine from Miami. And he wore uh, rings and enormous every finger. And once I was at his house and he was just kind of dozing off and he had his hands in, a, in this position, I gave him this idea to cast his hands. I made a mold of his hand. And he's, he passed away last year. Um, and uh, it kind of became this, I guess, this monument to him. And um, um, then trying to come up with also like strategies of how to frame photographs, because I was doing a series of these black and white photographs, which I'm not going to show tonight, but uh, that was exploring the same idea. So taking something from high design and, and, and clashing it with something that's more of these uh, culturally specific. Uh, and so this was a sculpture that I designed out of, it's, a, it's a, a lead coconut with a rope chain antenna, and it has a, it's a and the, the uh, photograph, the black and white photograph, the silver print is impaled in, the, uh, in a claw, and it holds it up. Um, but the rope chain being this very iconic uh, item, and then I, by casting it straight, and I did, then I did playing around with some ideas of furniture, and trying to get a use factor out of the, the series of benches that I did and chairs that had that was using the uh, the chain as a support. Um, this one, uh, another cast of my hand with uh, with brass knuckles, and this comes from uh, in Cuban culture and Caribbean culture, Afro Caribbean, particularly my my grandmother was Afro Cuban. Um, there is this. Uh, they put these amulets on you when you're a child. They're called atabaches, or these uh, small, uh, carved out of a black ebony, an ebony stone, and it's a fist, and it's supposed to thwart off the evil eye. And uh, most Caribbean children, and not America too, but particularly countries that have a, a, a big Afro uh, influence, uh, have it. So I wanted to revisit that and made a cast of my hand and, and they're usually always a fist and I want and then I wanted to add this contemporary element of resistance. This is a more recent piece of uh, these brass knuckles. Um, but then the interest of this one was inspired by Andre the Giant and um, I think anyone's ever seen that iconic photograph of Andre the Giant whose hand he could cup a, a can of beer in his hand. So I was able to find uh, someone had made a mold of his hand, a plaster cast, and was able to ca uh, scan, make a scan of it, and then make a stainless steel version of it, and um, holding an actual can of beer. Again, that references something that was influential in my the imagination of my my childhood. Um, this is my hand again. I'm working. This is working back to my hand, but blown up this gift about four feet tall. And it's my hand, because the thing is, like growing up with my hands, I was always told I had very effeminate hands, and uh, in my family, these very macho dudes with these big hands and And I was never like good at sports. I had really, so I, I wanted to do this, um, this trend, this kind of, uh, kind of like, so made a scan of my hand and blew it up big and cast it in bronze, and put put on these long nails. So you can't really identify like the hand could be female or. or or male. Um, this other piece of here, this one is a, a column of now defunct vintage pagers, beepers, that are cast in bronze. And they're the height of a, they're about my height, and the head is a cast basketball that has a wedge on the bottom, and on top is, an, is a, a Gumby uh, hair piece that was very popular when I was in high school. A lot of friends of mine had it. And um, there it is. Um, this is a series that I worked on for a while. I'm still working on it, where I wanted to take up, I wanted to try making two-dimensional flat work. Or I mean, I've, not, I've never made a painting. And this is the closest I've ever come to uh, mark making or image uh, two-dimensional 
representation as such, but they're constructed as um, uh, sculptures, so they're cast. It's basically asphalt that's been, uh, it's an aggregate with a bonding agent, and they're framed, and I draw with chains, gold or silver chains, and while it's still wet, then I'll, I put pressure and push it down. I got the idea from walking around the city, New York, right, Brooklyn, where I live, and the asphalt has all kinds of detritus that gets pushed into the asphalt over the years. And this black ground, I thought was a very interesting um, uh, vehicle to do. So I started to make renderings and started to do, and it became about drawing, really. It was more about this gesture. These are about five feet tall, up to, some are eight feet tall. So it became about just gesture making and very, um, in a way, kind of revisiting these very um, modern, tropes, things that I never hadn't touched before. But again, the, the materials were made sense to me. Um, and these are another, another outdoors. These are larger scale. Uh, again, this is, a, again, harping on this kind of absurd um, surreal moments with my hand. It's about uh, five feet tall. And then there's a head. The head on the back is a copy of a Picasso Fernandand, a cubist head that I attached to the. Um, this piece, uh, got, it was like two stories connecting. And I was, um, so the, when the um, x-ray was discovered, in the mid 1800s, um, the scientist who discovered it used his wife. The first x ray ever made was of his wife's hand. And if you look up the image of the first x ray, it's a, it's a hand, and, there's, and she's wearing her wedding ring. And the story goes that in these early days, she eventually, he eventually, she was his guinea pig for the first series of x rays, and he eventually killed her, like she died of cancer. Um, they didn't know this, of course, back then. So it was very tragic. And then uh, I was thinking about uh, Biggie Smalls when he got killed in LA outside of the uh, Auto Museum. And he was, his music and his, was very important to me uh, growing up and in art school. And there was this connection about, I was interested in his jewelry, and I was doing research like, what jewelry was he wearing? The, the, the night that that happened. And one ring that he always had was what's called a Rolex ring. Um, so I made a cast of that in the hand. So the, the, the piece has, like it, those two story inform the, the, the piece. Um, in a way, it's like a, an ode to him. And then um, um, I think I'm revisiting again, uh, uh, again, like just kind of having fun to kind of create something that's completely absurd, but it has some kind of use factor, this big flower pot that's a cast in my hand wearing a, a version of a Rolex ring and a, a lion's head ring, which in my family, for some reason, men in my family, had, like a lot of them had either a, a, an Indian head ring or a lion's head ring. And that's about it for the image. How are we doing on time? We're good? Okay. So should we, because I have a thing, to, I don't know if I should show the video or not, but. I think you should show the video. Okay. So just to give you like, a, so what I've showed you is um, uh, all the artwork that I do that's only gallery based, but I also do projects that I'm always interested in that are outside of art. So this was a, a job that came up of the, uh, a chance to make a music video. And it was to, it, it was to be, um, it's this guy from LA called M. Rivers and Dan the Automator, who is a DJ, did the, uh, did the remix and the production of it. And it was a chance to do a dance video, you know, booty shaking video, which is, you know, very problematic in its own sense. So I said, okay, well, that's a challenge. So this thing happened. So it's, it's connected to my work as in form of my work, but it's, is it art? I don't know, let's see. Mystical mystic, off of the grid don't become a statistic, so optimistic, won't bite the biscuit, feel like a skeleton, 
In the Old Testament. Champion, champion. Champion, champion. Fucking bitches. Champion, champion. Oh shit. You're late. One of these days you should let me in this fucking place with you. <laughs> you should be careful what you wish for. life I was chosen. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your relationship with minimalism. Uh, I see a lot of sort of maximalism in the work, but references to minimalism, uh, even in terms of like minimalist performance like Nauman. Uh, so I was wondering what the sort of connection between minimalism and maximalism would be for you. Right. Um, that's a good question. Um, it's definitely, um, let's see, I was raised in a maximalist house. So very Baroque, very dense, my experience. And um, that is me wrestling with uh, what art school, art history. And um, so when I was in art school, of course, I went complete opposite of where I was from. And all through undergrad and up to grad school, uh, was very interested in minimalism, conceptual art, and um, Avoiding, I guess, you know, running away from what I was, and um, so, and you know, it's still I'm a huge fan of it. I love it. I mean, it's still my 
my personal space is still very aware, like where I live is very um, not, I'm gonna say a maximalist space. So the work, there's this tension between that being more biographical, where I'm from, and then what, I, what I've learned. But then, if you want to get more specific about uh, the history of minimalism, I mean, do you have anything in particular you wanted to, I don't know, like, yep, like Nauman, yeah, Nauman is, uh, which at this point I remember it's, like, it's almost like Nauman's almost like a cliche, because he's so, he's like, you know, the air of the water, uh, maybe it's like yeah, Nauman, Nauman. But, um, when I did that piece, because Nauman spoke a lot to me when I was an undergrad, yeah, and then, this is in the mid-90s in Chicago. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I mean, weird connections, like Hannah Mendieta and Carl Andre throwing her out of a bathroom window. I mean, like, there's like all of this, it's all there. It's, it's like that narrative haunted me. Of course, when you first learn of that in, in art school, you're like, what, really? Because I knew about Hannah Mendieta from Miami, because her work is very present in that community, in the Cuban community, but then learning about Carl Andre. Oh, and Carl Andre's the guy who threw out the window and got away with it. So, like, that's there. That Baroque narrative is there, too. Um. Any other questions? No more questions? Oh, there we go. Oh gosh, I just dropped my phone. It's okay. Um, I'm just curious about the boom box. I mean, I know it definitely probably is something within your childhood, but like what in particular, like what moment in time are you like, yes, like music in general, or is it the boom box? Like, what sort of about it? Yeah, actually that ties into minimalism too, because um, the boom box was there from biographical narrative point of entry, um, and I knew about the boom box before, but I knew about minimal art, but, but then made the connections of, when I started to revisit the boom box in the work, it was thinking about the primary structures and rectangles and squares, and the boom boxes are, are bricks and are rectangles, but they're charged with all of this social narrative. And, um, and also that, also like the chains, the same way I'm trying to use the chains as mark making or as paint, but as lines on a field, on a ground. And, um, but the chains, if you want to read into them, have another layer if you want to go there. Um, so the boombox served, in a way they started to, because I've never been in my work, I've never, uh, you know, I've never made a, uh, an image of myself in my work. Um, but so the, for a while the radio was standing in as a, a surrogate for me or a stand-in. Like in the early photographs and in the film, the child metamorphosizing into this radio and he gets, uh, and he, he gets freed by this character and he gets taken away from the mother or that world that he lives in and he leaves. Um, so yeah, the radio had many, it, it, it served its function you know, in many ways. Over here. Yeah, over there. Yeah. Oh, there. Oh, there's some. Oh, sorry. I just didn't. Okay. That side next. Um, so I came in a little late, so I might have missed this, but I was curious about your motivations um, using film um, as opposed to like digital medium. Right. <clears throat> um, these projects, in, it's funny because I was speaking to Gretchen about this earlier, and I'm pursuing now other film, more narrative film projects, um, more commercial narrative film projects. And uh, these films in particular, I wanted them to reference a certain aesthetic. And at the time when I made them, film was still the best way to do it. It was also a certain fetishism, and I wanted to go through the process of shooting a film the way it might have been done in 1984 and use the same techniques, nothing that was available now, um, but it was more. It's it was more of a stylistic thing. And also, the but now digital has got to the point where you could do that, and you have to be a very very trained eye to really discern the difference uh, at at a cinematic scale. Um, and now at that point, it was still. I mean, these were very challenging to make. They were very expensive. They took a long time, but. Uh, now it would be 
it's almost impossible. I mean, it would just be so expensive to do it in film that now, so, but for photography, I still do, I shoot, shoot film because it's still feasible and it's still, I can still control that and it's um, practical. Um, and I still like to shoot large format. And, um, and yeah, if I get an opportunity to shoot film again, I would, but it's a lot of it, it's contingency of not, it's not, it's easy anymore to shoot 30, super 35 anamorphic. Do you ever have uh, trouble like deciding what uh, medium to use for each project, each idea? Um, well, no, I mean, there's, there's always been this overarching theme of interested in these signs of resistance or these markers and of mining my past and my environment and what I'm interested in at the moment. But um, I guess I, I have a, I don't have like too many ideas, so I have to, so a lot of these projects, we just saw them in some loose chronological order, but they're happening parallel, so because the films are happening, which takes sometimes up to a year to make, um, all of the sculptures and photographs are also happening at the same time and being exhibited, so it's like you have always three or four things going on, but yeah, the part of editing ideas is sometimes difficult and, there's been a lot of failures, which you haven't, you're not going to see. And uh, so there's a lot of waste, you know, there's always a lot of stuff that never leaves a studio. Um, and I tend to work where I, uh, there's a lot of planning, a lot of um, before something is executed, which that's mostly how I work, but that's another reason why I gravitated to make those chain paintings. I wanted to do something that was more immediate in the studio where I could go in and, you know, being just, jealous of my painter friends who could go into the studio and, you know, like, you know, just like jam for a day and maybe it's bad, maybe it's a good day, maybe it's a bad day, but mark making. So, so it, it balances out, you know, months and months of research and planning and organizing and putting things together. But I'm comfortable with that too. It's like, um, cool. I think we had one more question on this side. Okay. As far as the, um, the the cars and the vehicles where you photographed the vehicles and then the landscapes. How did you really find those people? Was it at the car shows? And then, like, did you have them bring the cars to the to the location? And then also, how many boom boxes do you have in your collection? <laughs> <laughs> um. The radio collecting, it got out of control and I had to stop. I think I stopped at 17 because they just take up so much room. They're huge. Um, and now they're scattered in between my house and friends' houses. I just lend them out. Um, and I stopped, I stopped collecting because I, I go, I, as a, since I'm a kid, I've always collected things. And then you have to, but your interests stop after you've had, you've found all the holy grails, you're done, and you move on to something else. So I had all, I got all the boomboxes I wanted. But so back to the, uh, the car uh, project. That was difficult because it was a two-year project of, cult, you know, going around the city, the city, the country to car shows, uh, trolling the blogs, all of the that that are related to lowriders and cars, calling up car clubs. Um, it started from Miami, and it you know, and, ex and expanded because they went from all. Oh, I mean, from Texas, California, Midwest, pretty much everywhere, those, those cars were happening. And then, but it was a matter of getting trust. Also, I was, had a very particular vision of wanting to find as many brands as I could, and the most ubiquitous ones were Louis Vuitton and Gucci, which was like, I saw a lot of those cars. So it was harder to pinpoint. Like you don't, you don't, the whole series, I think, yielded, like two years of work maybe yielded under, maybe 20 images. Um, half of cars, and then at w halfway through the project of the cars, I started to meet people that were making cars, but also doing garments. And then that led me into following to find the people that were selling them, making them at home. In Miami, I found, uh, you know, and it was a matter of getting to trust, because a lot of the, the lowrider guy cars, you show up, they're like, oh, I want to shoot your car. And they're like, oh, yeah, what magazine are you with? I'm like, oh, it's not lowrider magazine, it's not... They're like, 
hey, you know, it's an art project, and they're like, and I, I just want to shoot their interior. They're like, yeah, what about the rest of the car? So it, it, it became this, you know, building trust, you know, this relationship. So I had to have that relationship with these people and to gain their trust and then to uh, allow them into their private space to make a picture of it, you know. And then I would give them a, a photograph, of course. So in terms of the background, the photographs, they're, they're two separate photographs. It's photoshopped, yeah, because it was impossible because the cars, I never knew they were going to find them. Someone's garage, you know, some parking lot. And then there was this, this, this whole process of, you know, getting the lighting in the car to then match a landscape that I would, who knew I would didn't go on these trips to find landscapes later, and then ma marry them. So yeah, so it was a very long, slow process. Great, I think we'll wrap it up there. Let's give them another round of applause. Thank you so much, Luis. Thank you.